Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Darren, a first year medical student studying at Monash University here in Melbourne, Australia. I'm going to know with Term 2 a lot of the math stacks are coming up with special methods. So for today I think I'd go into one of the neglected part of exams in general, uh, which is reading time. So I'll be going through a past exam and just talking about what I'd be thinking about in terms of reading time, which is really important, right? You get 15 minutes, no writing, but to look through the questions, see what you can do with them. And um, so my general line of thinking is to figure out how to do the question without actually doing the question. I think when you start doing some maths in your head, it's really easy to go wrong. Whereas um, if you're just getting your head around the question, getting your approach right, then that can be very, very helpful for when writing time starts. So this is the 2011 exam one for math methods. Um, it's a relatively early exam. I didn't want to get any of the recent ones because I know you guys might like to do them. Um, and also in about like one month, no, one and a half months time, it's probably time to start thinking about doing exams. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just be going through this and just showing you what I'll be thinking and skipping like the statistic probability questions. All right, so let's get straight into it. So I'll be annotating it just to show what I'll be thinking, but obviously you can't do it in reading time. Cool. All right. So we'll get question one, right? With these differentiation questions, I just try and think about like what um, technique I need to use. So I think to myself, okay, differentiate, um, and there's a square root here. Um, I'd probably use chain rule. And the reason for that is because you can write a square root like that. So I think to myself, okay, be brackets to a half. I'll use chain rule. I don't do any maths in my head, too risky. Um, and then I move on to the next question. All right. So here, um, it's me to find the derivative and sub in x equals part six. What rule do I need to use here? I need to use product rule. And that's as far as I go. And I just make a note to myself, don't forget to sub in this. Maybe circle it when I start, but don't forget to sub it in. Don't just find the derivative and move on. And um, yeah, that's as far as I go in terms of thinking. Next, antiderivative. So I think to myself, okay, so I got one on three x minus four. I'll be using log with this. So I antiderive, antiderive it. I'll have logs in my answer. With B, solve the equation. I'm looking at it. It's in sort of a form I recognize. They often try and trick you with these. And it's in quadratics. You can solve it using quadratics. And the way to do this is 2 to the 2x. Uh, you can rewrite this. All right, so here, whoops, log. And here, 2 to the 2x. And then I can sort of see that I have a quadratic, which is should be solvable. Um, if I want to go further, I can sort of think about um, taking away 16 from both sides and thinking about what factors um, I can have, um, but uh, there is, uh, yeah, no, no real need to um, do that if you, you no know, real need to do that in that first reading through, um, you can get back to this um, afterwards. Next question, state the range of periods. So range, I think about, um, it's transformed four up, amplitude is three, okay, cool. So it'd be, uh, so um, here, the range, um, it's translated for up, and the amplitude is 3, so it would be 1 to 7, um, and it's reflected in the x-axis first off, so it doesn't affect anything like that. It'd just be um, 1 to 7. Period, I do 2 pi. Remember, it's always 2 pi divided by whatever the coefficient of x. I wouldn't do that in my head. It's really easy to flip things the wrong way. Um, so... Yeah, I just think to myself, that's the math I'll be doing once I get into it. So the benefit of this way is that, like, you know, once you get started, you have an approach that you can use for every question um, that's viable. So you just give that a go. If it doesn't work, then we can move on from there. But um, at least we have security and confidence in that we know how to tackle each question or we have a method of tackling each question. Solve the equation. So this one is just a classic. Just be aware of the um, the domain and you just solve it however you want to solve it. Some people use translations, some people, um, yeah, people have different ways of solving these types of questions. Just go with your way. All right, so this question is a bit more um, thinking involved because it's sort of a word question with steps and, and parts. So um, if f of x has this um, rule and g of x has this rule, find integers this. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I probably need to find f of g of x. And so what does f of g of x kind of look like? So f of g of x involves me subbing this, um, x plus 5, into x squared. So I sort of have x plus 5 squared, I'll write this out, um, minus 9. 
and I would expand it and hopefully it comes out to a good quadratic that I can factorize quite nicely because I need to get into that form. Um, so that's kind of what I'll be thinking. I wouldn't be expanding this in my head or thinking about too much maths, it's just the process. In terms of B, find the maximum domain for which f of g of x is defined. Sometimes with these composite functions, you need to consider the domain of g of x and the relationships between f of x and g of x. Uh, the range of g of x is like a subset of the domain of f of x. Um, but here, since you found the um, rule for f of g of x here, square root means that there is limits to the domain. And so I know when I get into writing time, I'll be working around this square root, seeing when it exists, when it doesn't exist. Um, it's a bit hard to do when you just have C and D and not proper numbers, um, but uh, I'll be able to do it once you know, writing time starts. And that's enough for me. I would move on. All right, there's probably distribution. It's not covered. Also, I'd, yeah, modulus isn't in the syllabus either. So question six, simultaneous linear equations. Find the value of k for which there are infinitely many solutions. I'm thinking to myself, usually solutions, it's discriminant involved. Here, it doesn't, it's not that type of question. There's no quadratic, so I wouldn't use discriminant. And then I kind of look at this style of question, and they're both lines, the equations, the linear equations, right? So it's essentially asking me that to solve these two, um, I want infinitely many solutions, which means that they're the same line. Right? If this is one line, this is another, and I want them to always be equal, it means they're the same line. So the way I can do that is I can move, um, write both of these in the form y equals y equals, and then equate the gradients and then to equate that C value. So if y equals mx plus C, um, you would equate the gradients, so m1 and m2, and equate the C value, c1 and c2. And that means you have the exact same line and means there are infinitely uh, many solutions. So uh, yeah, find the value of C, another thing to be aware of, there should be one value, oh, k, okay. there should be one value of k. Uh, so that's what I'm thinking in my head. This style of question comes over quite a lot, um, and you'll get used to this infinitely many um, solutions with linear equations. Find the value of k for which there is a unique solution. Thinking about them as two lines, a unique solution means they're not parallel and they're not the same line. Um, so essentially, um, you want their m value to be different. Anytime the m value is different, it means that they're not parallel and they're not the same line. Um, and so I would compare the m values, which compare m values, which I, um, and I have the rearranged lines in part A, so it's good to use the info from there, which is why also it's one mark. So you can kind of check your working out with the mark allocation. Um, don't follow it too much. Sometimes um, follow your own logic. The mark allocation isn't always um, the most rigid rule. But um, it's, it's good to use as a guide sometimes, especially if it's one mark. Usually if it's one mark, there's a shortcut or some kind of trick. So yeah, compare m values. That's what I'll be doing when I get to this question in, reading uh, in writing time. And yeah, I think the rest of these are all coin questions. Okay, there's one here. Cool. So this is trigonometry. Um, reading the question, wireframe, point D. All right, they've labeled all this, two centimeters, eight centimeters for me. Part two. Sure, they've labeled that as well. And CBD is that. So find BD and CD in terms of A and pi. So BD and CD, for me, we have this angle, we have this side. I'll just be using trig, and I can work this out um, because you just use trig, sine, and cos. And I'm considering using tan. So once I find BD, I can kind of use tan, but I think it'll be much simpler just to use A because here I will have some kind of trig value because I've used trig to find BD. And so I don't want to have like to cancel stuff um, when I'm finding CD. So that's what I'm thinking. I'll just be using trig and A and theta to get my answer. Because A theta and they're in a triangle. So um, trig works, right angle triangle. Find the length L centimeters of the Y in the, flame, in the frame, including length BD in terms of A and theta. So looking at A, we would have found BD, we would have found CD. Um, and so it's just a matter of BD plus CD plus A plus two plus two plus BD again. So I just write it all out, add it up, and that should be my answer. Find DL, D theta, and hence show that DL, D theta equals zero when BD equals two CD. So we know L equals, and then we just derive that in terms of theta. Um, so yeah, derive it. Hence show that equals that when BD equals CD, uh, equals two CD. So um, I would you know sub in BD equals two CD, 
and show that dl equals d zero at that point or some people go the other way and they um, sort of work with this equals zero and then reach the conclusion that bd equals cd but i feel like um, it's much quicker and also considering that it's two marks to just sub this in so bd equals cd use that as your assumption because it's saying when um, you sub it into there and then it happens it should equal zero um, as to what the derivative looks like, as to what exact numbers I'm subbing in, it's a bit murky. I can't see that far into the future, um, but I know what I need to do process-wise, which is what's important. Find the value of L if A equals 3 root 5, a uh, maximum value of L. So with maximums, it's usually endpoints or um, stationary point. Considering it's a triangle, usually the endpoints are a bit, like, usually they don't exist, like it, it becomes a line or something like that. So I'm thinking, especially because in C, they wanted us to find the stationary point, um, it wants us to use that. And um, you can kind of see that the reason why they want you to find BD equals CD rather than values is because you have this A here. A is a positive constant. And so all your values BD, CD have A in them. So you can't actually find what the values are because of that unknown constant, um, but you can find the relationship between them. However, once you get to here, you can find it. You can find BD, you can find CD because they've told you what A is. Um, and so uh, once you know what A is, you can also find what feta is because you can use trigonometry to find that out. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to use trig. Find the maximum value of L if A equals 3 root 5. Um, so if A equals 3 root 5 and I can find... Okay, if A equals through 5, yeah, so I can find feta, and I just add up the values, and that's the uh, maximum value of L. Uh, remembering that when A equals through 5, the maximum value of L, um, it probably occurs when, when this is the case, when BD equals 2CD. So if we weren't given this piece of information, then you wouldn't, the values would um, differ a little bit, because you wouldn't know the relationship between CD um, and BD. But because you do know, um, due to the information from C, knowing that A equals three, root equal 3 times root 5 means you can find BD, which means you can find CD as well. And that helps you uh, get the value of L, which is the required answer here. So um, the most important takeaways are to... It doesn't really matter how fast you reach it or how quickly you see the answer, but it's just important that you can try and come up as best you can with a method of tackling the question. Um, you don't, might not be able to see it through to its end, but um, you want to be able to at least see how to start it off so that you have some confidence in, in um, when you start writing time. I find this is good in two ways. One, you, you feel more confident in reading time. You're like, okay, I know how to approach these questions. I can do them. And also once you get into it, you can do it um, much quicker. So a couple of things to be aware of. Don't go too much into the maths, too in depth. Sometimes it's really easy to make mistakes there. Um, and also... Um, and also, uh, be, be flexible as well. So once you start writing time, don't get too stuck up in what you did in reading time. If it doesn't work, change it. And also just be very conscious of what you're doing. You don't want to have made any mistakes in reading time, um, in, even in your process, which is, yeah, even in your process, um, which carries through to writing time. You want to try to avoid that uh, as much as possible. So uh, thank you guys for watching today's video. I hope this maths related video has helped. Um, I'm limited in <laughs> what resources I can show because of copyright reasons. I can't really show school stuff. Um, and so, um, yeah, I've been using this, this VCAR one. Hopefully it's helped. You've seen how I think through in reading time and you can apply it to your own SACs. It is really important, often neglected. Um, so I encourage you guys to, uh, yeah, practice that. Um, good luck for all your math SACs and I look forward to seeing you all next time.